Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 3G, where we're going to talk about proteins that regulate transcription. We'll first introduce the different kinds of regulation, and then discuss this particular kind of transcription, also called gene, regulation of gene expression. And we'll do several examples of things, phenomena that you're probably somewhat familiar with, but that you hadn't realized had a basis in gene regulation. So first, I need to clarify that there are actually three kinds of regulation that can control what the products of genes are doing. And the first is regulation of whether or not the gene is transcribed. And this is often called regulation of gene expression. The second is regulation of what happens to the messenger RNA produced by transcription. Is the messenger RNA translated? This is often called, rather confusingly, post-transcriptional regulation. And finally, there's the regulation of protein activity. What does the protein do once the messenger RNA has been translated into protein? What's the protein going to do and when and where is it going to do it? Now we're going to do these in a different order. We're starting with the regulation of transcription in this lecture. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about the regulation of protein activity. And then finally, we'll come back to talk about an example of the regulation of translation. So here's a schematic of the regulation of transcription. And the most important thing to notice is that there are multiple transcriptional activator proteins which together regulate the activity of RNA polymerase. The gene has a promoter, but RNA polymerase isn't going to bind to that promoter until it gets signals from the other proteins that are regulating this gene. So these proteins, depending on cellular conditions, will end on the binding of other proteins, will bind to sequences in front of the promoter, creating a condition where RNA polymerase is now able to bind to the promoter and synthesize messenger RNA. Now, here's an example. In an earlier lecture in this module, I showed you morning glory flowers that were a very pretty blue color, and I said that they were blue because the blue was produced by the pigment cyanidin that was synthesized by this catalytic pathway. This was an example of the funk of catalytic proteins. But often we see morning glories that have white flowers instead of blue flowers. And you might think that, well, you get white pigment if you have a mutation that, say, inactivates some step in the pathway leading to the blue pigment. But in fact, that's not the usual way that the white flowered variants of morning glories are formed. Instead, what happens is that normally the synthesis of this whole pathway is controlled by a transcriptional regulatory protein called a transcription activator, and it's a member of a gene family called MYB. Most transcription activators are members of large families of related regulatory proteins. So this MYB protein in morning glory flowers activates transcription of the genes for the pathway to produce the blue pigment. But mutations in the transcription activator can prevent the pathway from being turned on and produce white flowers. And here are examples of two different mutations in this family. The first is a six base pair insertion. And we know from thinking about different kinds of mutations in module two that this insertion is going to add two extra amino acids to the protein, but it isn't otherwise going to change the protein. However, the second insertion is an insertion of 19 base pairs. This is not a multiple of three, so it's going to change the reading frame. It's going to do what we call shift the reading frame. And that means that all the protein sequence beyond this point is gibberish because the ribosome is reading in the wrong reading frame. 
and this mutation is sufficient to cause the morning glory flowers to be white. Now, here's a second example that you might be familiar with. These are different kinds of oranges, and you notice that many of them have a deep red pigment, and they're called blood oranges. So Moro is a variety of blood orange. Ota 9 is a variety of blood orange. Jingxian is a Chinese variety that has red pigment in it. What you might not know is that the ordinary orange color oranges aren't called orange oranges. They're called blonde oranges. I just learned that while re researching how the, the regulatory changes I'm about to describe were discovered. So what makes some oranges have deep red pigment? Well, we now know that the gene for the red pigment is controlled. The red pigment is anthocyanin. This is another complex um, biosynthetic pathway that synthesizes pigments. This pathway is controlled by another transcription activator. This belongs to a different family called MY, MBD. And this particular transcription factor was named Ruby because it controls the production of red pigment in oranges. So normally, Ruby is off in oranges. The red pigment can be synthesized in other parts of the plant. Anthocyanins play many important roles in plant metabolism. But in blood oranges, the ruby gene has been activated to a much higher level. And it's been activated not by a point mutation, but by the insertion of a mobile element. This is one of those genetic parasites that we discussed earlier that can insert into the genome and insert into genes. In this case, it's inserted upstream of a gene. And it, as we described, it contains its own promoter pointing out of the element. So here's the element. Here's the element's promoter. And it's turning on transcription of the Ruby transcription activator which is turning on synthesis of, synthesis of anthocyanin in the oranges. Now, one other factor, one of the reasons that blood oranges are quite expensive is because it's really hard to get them red. If the weather's not cold enough, they don't get very red. And it turns out that that's because this genetic parasite, the mobile element TCS1, is sensitive to cold. It's more active when the tissues are cold. So the orange, the orange plant fruit makes more pigment when the oranges are cold. So that's a biochemical genetic explanation of how gene regulation controls whether or not oranges have the deep red pigment that makes us call them blood oranges. Now, here's a question. Consider a mutation in the regulatory sequence indicated by the blue star below. What's the most likely consequence of a mutation in this sequence on expression of the gene? So the most likely consequence is that expression is going to go down because the most likely consequence of changing the sequence of a regulatory binding site is that the protein is not going to bind there anymore. It won't recognize the site because the sequence has changed. And that's going to interfere with activation of transcription. Now, I want to show you a few more examples of the consequences of regulatory mutations. But this is a different kind of regulatory mutation. These are mutations that cause one kind of tissue to develop into a different kind of tissue. So these are developmental mutations that occur when the embryo is developing or when a part of the organism is developing. And the examples I'm going to show you are from plants, but similar mutations occur in animals as well.
um, we like these mutations in plants because they often make the flowers look prettier. Um, but we consider them serious problems, usually when they happen in animals. So here's a normal poppy, and you can see it has the typical poppy structure. It's got simple petals, and then in the center of the plant, it's got the stamens that produce the pollen. Here's a mutant poppy. It doesn't have any stamens at all. Instead, the stamens have grown into little petals. And it's a very pretty poppy, but it's unable to reproduce because it doesn't have state doesn't make pollen. Here are some daffodils with similar problems. Here's a normal daffodil. You can see the reproductive structures inside the horn part of the daffodil. Here's another kind of daffodil that you can grow in your garden. It doesn't have any reproductive structures at all. No pistils and no stamen. All those parts have developed as flowers. And here's another daffodil that instead is making a whole bunch of little horns that look like they don't have any reproductive structures in them, but they look very pretty. Um, here's one last one. This is a camellia. Again, you can see all the stamens that should have pollen and the pistils in the center, and they're completely missing in the flower. Now, the red streaks are from a different mutation, probably another transposable element insertion. So what we've done, we've talked about how proteins regulate gene expression, that is, how they regulate the transcriptional activity of RNA polymerase by telling it when to use which promoters. And we talked about what changes when the genes for these proteins change. Um, sometimes there be, may be no production of the proteins that are regulated by these genes. Sometimes there'll be a protein product in a new location or new condition. And sometimes abnormal developmental pathways may be activated, um, in the case of flowers, producing all sorts of beautiful flowers. Coming up next, as I said, we're going to talk about how the activity of proteins is regulated, how once the protein is made, how do we control what it does. I hope to see you there.